Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. This is James Oldfield here with you, and we're glad you're with us and hope that you are ready for our study from God's Word. We invite you to encourage you to get your pen and paper and your Bible out and follow along with us. If you have a question about anything that's being said, um, jot it down or pick up the phone and give us a call. This is a live program where you can interact with us, and we'd be glad to hear your discussions on, on the topic we'll be talking about today. I... Uh, I think today is going to be a topic that I think probably everybody has uh, some sort of uh, uh, belief or feeling, opinion about. A lot of people believe in miracles and they uh, profess to see them daily and maybe they believe that they still exist today. And But we're going to be talking about what the Bible has to say about uh, miracles and speaking in tongues and things like that and helping us to have a greater understanding about what the Bible has to say and the purpose of miracles and you can hear me say this uh, time and time again that if you don't understand the purpose of miracles friends you'll miss what the Bible has to say about miracles and why they were even uh, used why God even used miracles and so we're going to be discussing that today and so does the Church of Christ uh, believe in miracles well as a as a member of the body of Christ uh, yes, I believe in miracles. <clears throat> I mean, I read them in the I read about them in the Bible, and so I, I believe that they existed. But they are not for today, and that's that's really the key. Is these miracles do not exist today, as they did in the Bible, and and the reason why I would say that is what we're going to be discussing in our lesson today. And so, if you have a if you have an idea about uh, a belief, something uh, along those lines about this topic, and you want to call in, uh, I'm sure I invite you to do that. We'll give you the phone number in just a moment. And uh, let's have some dialogue. Let's have some interaction between between us on this topic so we can fully have a greater understanding of, of God's will on this matter. Uh, but if you want to be a part of the program, the phone number is area code 336. It's 427-9696, 427 that's 427-WMYN. That's area code 336. 336-427-9696 or 627-9563. 627-WLOE. 627-9563. You can reach me at 276-340-2653. 276-340-2653. And if you want to call, um, if you want to call that number, that is my cell number, but you can call and, and we can, uh, Put you on the air that way. We'll be glad to have any discussion with you that that uh, we can, and so you can reach me there at two seven six three four zero two six five three. A word from the Lord at gmail dot com. A word from the Lord at gmail dot com is how you can reach me by email. So maybe you want to send your email questions in, and and we'll answer it that way. We can uh, do a whole lesson on it, or or as much time as we need to to answer it fully and completely. And so we want to to know that we enjoy your Bible questions. We enjoy people asking questions of us. Not everybody in the religious world uh, wants to answer questions. Not everybody in the religious world likes to be questioned. They want you just to take what they say at face value and, and never scrutinize or uh, you know be, be critical uh, about what they say or believe. But friends, the only way we're going to learn is if we are critical. If we ask the questions why. If we ask the questions you know how or or when and where, and, and start trying to delve into what the Bible has to say, can we really, uh, that's the only time we're really going to come to a greater uh, knowledge and appreciation and, and love of the truth. And so it, it takes a little digging. Jesus uh, said, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, John 5, 39. If you're, if you're going to be looking for the truth, you're going to have to, to dig a little bit, search a little bit, uh, he said again that, uh, you know, ask and it shall be given, seek and you shall find. You've got to do some seeking, you've got to do some digging. And oftentimes when, when people say something about what the Bible teaches or what they believe, you know, you ought to have a question uh, coming back. You ought to say, well, you know, why is that? Explain that to me. And, um, you know, sometimes people say, well, y'all have an answer for everything. Well, friends, when you're reading the Bible... And you know that there is more on a particular matter than what most people 
think or have considered, it's going to seem like we always have an answer, but that's because we're trying to give you, paint a full picture, um, you know, give you all the information you need. And so it is the case that oftentimes when people are studying topics like, like this one, for example, about miracles, speaking in tongues, and things like that, most people haven't considered the whole topic about miracles. And so uh, anything that is said from the Bible is going to seem like a contradiction to what most people believe because they don't know all the answers or they don't have, haven't studied in its fullest. And you know, as we, as we talked about last week, there is a way that you can study and you can get a whole lot of information on any particular subject. I think last week we talked about, about baptism, but um, you can do the same thing with miracles or speaking in tongues or the gift of the Spirit. You can do the same thing and you'll come to a greater understanding and appreciation about what God's uh, will is or what his mind is on this particular matter. So uh, so let's get into this. We're, we're talking about miracles. Uh, I, I think it's important that we define a miracle. Now, most people, when they define miracles, they're going to define it as, you know, something amazing or something astounding and something to, that uh, makes them in awe. I think the first thing that really comes to mind is uh, when someone... Uh, sees a baby or child being born, and oh, it's a miracle, the miracle of birth, the miracle of life. That, friends, that's not a miracle. It may be amazing. It's, it is uh, uh, pretty wonderful, uh, especially if you're, if you're able to see a, a child come into the world or any uh, living creature come into the world. The, 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 the act of birth is, is, is pretty awesome, but it's not a miracle. It's not a miracle. When God created the world, he put, he put laws in place, and that is what uh, we're still governed by. That's what we're still, uh, uh, you know, what the world is still operating on. For example, let's just go to Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. The Bible says that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now notice, in verse 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, let's come on down in the evening and the morning with the first day. Verse 6, God said, let there be a firmament in the waters, and let it divide water from water. And God made the firmament, that's the, that's the heavens, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And now notice, let's, let's come on down to verse... Uh, 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 11 and God said let the earth bring forth grass and the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth and it was so and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind the tree was yielding fruit uh, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind and God saw that it was good and evening morning the third day now when God created these these the plants, you know, the <clears throat> trees and the grass and so forth. That was a miracle. I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't any way for those um, things to come into existence except God created them and, and spoke them into existence. But after they were created, they reproduce after their own kind. And that's, that's the very law that God put in place there. Whose seed is in itself after his kind. The herb yielding seed after his kind. And so like begets like. That is, a, that is a fact of life. And that is the law that God put in place. Like is always going to beget like. If uh, two people uh, come together and have a child, they're going to have a human being. That's just all there is to it. I don't care if they're red, yellow, black, or white. If, if they have a child, it's going to be a human being. Uh, Cats produce cats, dogs produce dogs, and so forth. And so the, um, the law that God put in place was things were reproduced after their own kind. So the miracle was the creating of these uh, plants and animals. <clears throat> I mean, on the sixth day, the Bible says God said let the, uh, excuse me, on the, on the fifth day, God said let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth. In the, open, in the open firmament of heaven, and God created the whales and every living th creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, 
and every winged fowl after his kind, and God said it was good. All of these things are are going to be reproducing after their kind. But it was a miracle when God first created, and the same thing was true with the with the uh, the beast and the cattle after his kind. I mean, just read through the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter one, you'll see all these times. You'll listen to all the times that God says, after his kind, after his kind, after his kind. And it's because like is going to beget like. So it was a miracle to bring something in existence without it being reproduced after a natural law. But the natural laws now are in place. And so there, there's no miracles of creation uh, in, in the world today. I don't know why anyone, I don't think anyone makes that argument that there are more things being created uh, today. Uh, but yet, when it comes to other aspects of the miraculous nature, people say, well, yeah, they're still today. Well, friends, let's, so let's define a miracle. A miracle is a power that supersedes or goes beyond or suspends those natural laws that God put in place. And so there are some things that just happen naturally. We say that, well, you know, this happens naturally. But a, something that's supernatural is something that's going to go beyond or suspend that, that law that God put in place. For example, in, uh, in uh, Genesis, let's see, in Genesis uh, chapter 5, I believe this is where we want to go. Uh, in Genesis chapter 5, we meet a man named Enoch. And the Bible says, Enoch lived six, 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Friends, that was a miracle in the sense of Enoch did not die. All right? Enoch did not die, but everybody else that was living during that time, they're, they're going to die. Um, and so, and, unless the Lord comes back, we're all going to die. That is part of life. That's part of nature. That's part of the natural course of things. Now, the only way, the only way that that's going to change is if the laws of nature are suspended. And when Christ comes back, they're all going to be suspended. It's going to come to an end. All of nature is going to come to an end. And um, the Bible says in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17 that we which are alive and shall remain and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So if you're alive when the Lord returns, you are going to uh, participate in the miracle of bypassing death. But in the event that you're not, uh, death is going to meet you, and that is, a, that is part of the natural process. All right. Now, here's a good example of this. In Numbers chapter 16, Numbers chapter 16, uh, we have Moses is dealing with uh, a group of guys, Korah and uh, a, a Dathan and Abiram, and they're speaking against Moses, and, and Moses is telling everybody, you need to separate yourselves from them. And let's just read in verse 28, Numbers chapter 16, verse 28. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. So there was something that, that Moses and everybody else recognized. Death is common. This is, this is part of life. So if, if men die the common death, if they, if they live out their lives and die of natural causes, I mean, we, we use that term, don't we? The person died of natural causes, all right? Well, and, and what that means is, well, that's the natural process of life. You live and you die. So he says that if these men die of natural death, natural causes common to all men, he said, the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open up her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertaineth unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then shall ye understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses and all the men that appertaineth unto Korah, and all their goods, they and all that appertaineth to them went down alive 
into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. Friends, that was a miracle. That was a miracle. That was not part of the natural course of things. You know, you don't read in the, you don't read in the obituaries. Well, you know, here's here's uh, Mr. Smith. He died of natural causes, and then here's here's uh, Miss Jones. She died of natural causes. Then you get come down here to a, a, a another person. You know, um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Evans. Well, how did he die? Well, the earth opened up there, opened up, and just swallowed him up whole, swallowed him up alive, and no, see that, that that's not natural causes. That that wouldn't be a natural cause. That would be something that super that suspends the the laws of nature. All right, and so this is what we're talking about. When we're talking about miracles, we need to understand that we're talking about something that is not normal, not everyday, not not part of the natural process of things. Now, let me just say this point here: prayer is not a miracle. Uh, there was a preacher up in Martinsville. Uh, a few years ago that, that was trying to defend miracles and he said, well, prayer is a miracle because I can talk to, I can, I'm talking to someone that I haven't seen, that I can't see, and they, you know, and, and my prayer is answered, so prayer is a miracle. Friends, prayer is not a miracle. Just because you, you talk to someone that you can't see, which in this case would be God, just because you're talking to, to God and then you get an answer to a prayer, that is not a miracle. Uh, I can, I can get on my computer. I can order something in, in California. And never talk to a soul. I can just push a button, and the next day I can get whatever it is I ordered. Now is that a miracle? No. See, that's this is the natural way of things work. So, um, so prayer is not a miracle. Now I don't know all there is to know about prayer and providence and things like that. Um, I don't know how things work behind the scenes necessarily even the apostle paul said perhaps sometimes but uh prayer is not a miracle just because you don't understand something that doesn't mean it's a miracle um uh, a miracle has to su suspend or go beyond the laws of nature so uh that's what we're talking about when we're talking about miracles now friends this is this is important thing you need to remember about miracles and I know you've heard me say this again and again and you'll hear me say it as long as I live and am uh, talking about miracles miracles had to have a purpose all right when God used a miracle when God suspended laws of nature it was for a purpose it was part of his plan um, he didn't just do it just you know to showboat there was always part of God's plan, and miracles had a purpose in God's plan. God is always, uh, everything God does, he does for a reason. Uh, we may not know it or understand it, but miracles especially have a purpose. They have a part of God's plan. And miracles that you read about in the New Testament, these are things that were part of God's plan to reveal his will. Now, they served as confirming what was God's will. And I highly recommend, highly suggest, urge, and encourage you to mark in your Bibles and keep these uh, passages familiar in your mind when you're talking about miracles. Miracles always serve a purpose. All right, in Mark 16, Mark 16, 15 and 16, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, friends, have you ever stopped to think about why anyone would believe that a, that God, who n no one has seen, uh, sent his son to die on a cross and left instructions about what people should do so that they won't burn in an eternal hell that they've never seen. Why would anyone believe that? I mean, if someone came along and just started saying that, why would you believe it? So there has to be some reason that it is believed. And it's because the words that tell us about God and the words that tell us about Christ have been confirmed in such a way that there has to be a supernatural power behind them. All right? You say, well, I read the Bible and I believe it. But why do you believe the Bible? See, I believe the Bible because I 
can prove that it has been supernaturally confirmed, that it has been the, the that it is the the product of of God, a supernatural being, a spirit being. And so that's why I believe it. So when Jesus had gone to all the world and preached the gospel to every creature, he that believes and baptized shall be saved, he that believes not shall be damned. Why would anybody believe that? Why would anybody do that? Why would anyone confess that I believe Jesus Christ, Son of God, repent of their sins, and be baptized in water for the remission of their sins? Why would anybody do that? Unless there was convincing evidence that they should do it. All right? So that's why Jesus gave the Great Commission. And then in verse 17, he said, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So what was the purpose of these, of, of these signs? What was the purpose of casting out devils and speaking with new tongues and taking up serpents and, and uh, not being hurt if you drink something deadly and lay hands on the sick and recover them? What, what would be the purpose of that? Well, keep reading. Keep reading. Verse 19, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into the heaven, and stood on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Friends, the only way that anybody was going to believe these 12 guys that left, that started preaching in Jerusalem and went into all the world with a message about a risen Savior was because they were able to do things that no one could do except God be behind it. And that's the purpose of miracles. It is some, it's undeniable proof that God was behind it. In John chapter 3, uh, John chapter 3, Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, a Pharisee, came to Jesus by night. He said, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So, this is the purpose of miracles. Now, if you miss this, if you miss the fact that miracles are were used to confirm the message or confirm the messenger, then you'll miss everything about miracles. You 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 won't understand miracles. You'll think they're still today, and you know you know telling what you'll believe about it. All right. So we have to get that down. Now, God has always revealed His will through various means, and one way that he did that was he talked directly to people. Now, when he's talking directly to people, individuals, well, well they know are, I'm, I'm talking to God. I mean, I, I wonder what it was like for Abraham to talk with God. I wonder what it was like with Mo, for Moses to, to uh, speak directly with God as a friend speaketh to a friend. So when God is talking to them and saying, well, write this down, uh, that's one thing. But when God's word has been confirmed, it needs no more confirmation. So let's think about this. Let's say you have, um, I know you have um, uh, Moses. Moses goes up to the, uh, to the mountain and he gets down the Ten Commandments. He brings down the Ten Commandments. Um, how, how did the people know that that was from God? Is that? I mean, Moses goes up the mountain. He's there for forty days. So how how do the people know that this was uh, that this was a message from God? Well, just look at Exodus thirty four. Uh, Exodus thirty four. Let's start about verse uh, uh, twenty eight. Moses was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights, and he did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant the Ten Commandments. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount, from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh to him. And Moses called them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to them, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them the commandment, all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. Until Moses had done 
Speaking with them, he put a veil on his face, but when, the, when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out, spake to the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, uh, that the skin of Moses' face shone, and Moses put the veil on his face again until he went to speak with him. So how did, how did Moses confirm, or how was it confirmed that Moses was getting this information from God? Well, obviously his physical appearance changed. They knew Moses had been with God. Not to mention the fact that when Moses went up onto this mountain, he went up onto a mountain that, that God had said, no man should touch it and animals shouldn't touch it unless they be struck down dead. And so he was up there 40 days and 40 nights. And they know he's up there with God, so when he comes back down and he's, he's got this information, there's evidence that would, that would indicate, okay, this is from God. And I, you know, I don't know what they could hear. They could hear thunderings and things like that. I, I don't know if they actually were able to hear the audible voice of God, but the, the point is there was information, there was enough information to convince them, hey, th this is from God. And so once it has been written down, it doesn't need any more confirmation. Once something has been confirmed, or maybe a messenger has been confirmed as being from God, then you don't need any more confirmation. For example, like Samuel. In 1 Samuel 3, in verse 19. 1 Samuel 3, in verse 19. Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. How did they know he was a prophet? Because the way you knew if someone was a prophet or not was their words came to pass. And the Bible says that God did let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. They all came to pass. All right. So whenever someone is saying something and it all comes to pass and it, and it keep, continues to come to pass, uh, God's with them. You know, there's the indication that God is with him. So he was established to be a prophet of the Lord. So from then on, if Samuel spoke, someone said, well, that's, you know, Samuel is, uh, he, we know he's a prophet. We know he's a, he's a seer. We know he's a, he's a spokesman for God. So we're going to, you know, take what he says as, uh, as truth. So there, there, didn't necessarily need to be a miracle to confirm anything that Samuel said because he was confirmed. And that's what we're talking about. The same thing with Jesus in, in Acts chapter 10, or excuse me, Acts chapter 2, uh, in verse 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. So the man is confirmed as well. Now, every time Jesus spoke, he didn't he didn't perform a miracle because to some audiences he was already confirmed, he was already approved of, he was already you know everybody, he was already acknowledged that this is the Son of God, this is the Messiah. I mean, every time Jesus spoke to his disciples, you think he did a miracle to say, "Well, no, this is from God." No, because he was approved. See that? So whether it was the the messenger or the message. There had to be some confirmation, and once that was confirmed, then you didn't need a miracle. So that's that's the way it is today. Just because uh, there has been some miracles used to confirm the Bible, that doesn't mean that we need miracles today in order to keep on proving it. See, I mean, when 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 the New Testament was being written, now now you think with me. When the New Testament was being written. Uh, you know, after the Apostle in Acts two and so forth, the New Testament had not been written down. I mean, there hadn't been letters written to Rome, the the church at Rome. There weren't letters to the Corinthians. There weren't letters to the Ephesians. There weren't letters to uh, the church at Thessalonica. There weren't uh, the the letter to uh, Colossians, uh, Philippians, uh, Galatians, Ephesians. Um, those weren't written. I mean, the, the gospel hadn't even gotten to those towns yet. So, how was it that someone knew that someone was telling them something from God? I mean, I mean think about that. How did they know? How did they know? Well, John 14, John 14, verse 26, 
Jesus said, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall bring, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Okay? So, these uh, New Testament writers and apostles, they are being guided into all truth. They're being, uh, all things are being brought to their remembrance. But, if I were there, or if you were there listening to Peter and and uh, Andrew and James and John and Philip and Bartholomew, and you, you, you were hearing them, how would you know they were telling the truth? Or right, Jesus said, I'm going to guide you, not, the Holy Spirit's going to guide you in all truth, but what does that do for me, the listener? See? How do I know that? They know that. Jesus told them that, but how do I know that? John 16, 13 John 16 uh, and verse 13, Jesus said, The Spirit of truth, he will guide you to all truth. He will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. All right? That's fine for them, but how do I know that? How do I know that's what is happening to them when I hear them speaking? Well, there has to be some kind of confirmation that these people are saying something that they're only getting from God. And that was the point in Acts chapter 2 with the speaking in tongues. Every man was hearing them speak in their own language wherein they were born. All right? So the only way you know if something is from God is if it was verified. And that's why, that's why they were going to go forth and they were going to be able to do miracles and signs and wonders. And the word was being confirmed by them. All right? The word's being confirmed by them because... Otherwise, no one would know. No one would be able to say, well, this is from God because this man is speaking things and do, or he's doing things that only uh, a person who was with God who had God's approval could do. And if he can do these things that only a person who God is with can do, then what he's saying must be from God as well. All right? What he's saying must be from God as well. Now, in Hebrews 2, the writer says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? How was, how was that message confirmed? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. So how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation that was confirmed unto us by signs and wonders and diverse gifts and gifts of the Holy Ghost. I mean, how are you going to escape if you deny the very thing that, uh, that that's being told to save you and you're denying the, the confirmation of these things? So miracles served the purpose of not only bringing the truth, which would be the guiding, in all, uh, guiding them into all truth and all wisdom, but it was also confirming the things that were said. So the Holy Spirit was guiding men into all truth, and then the Holy Spirit was confirming it through these same men uh, through, through a miracle. And so that's the purpose of miracles. And again, if you forget that, if you get that, you're going to make a big mistake. Now, uh, when we're talking about miracles for today then, you need to realize that God could give knowledge. God could give knowledge, initially give knowledge to a person that he previously didn't know. And then once the task is done, he wouldn't need to continually give them inspiration to repeat that. I mean, if they wrote it down. Let me give you an example. In Exodus 31, I think I used this the other day in a lesson. In Exodus 31... The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name uh, Beziel, the, the son of Uri, or Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones, to set them in carving of timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. So, as God is giving instructions for the temple and for the ark and so forth, 
He says, I have given this man, I filled him with all wisdom, the Spirit of God and all wisdom and understanding and knowledge on how to do these types of workmanship, how to work with, with gold and the silver and brass and so forth, and cutting stones. Knowledge that he previously didn't know, but God said, I'm, I'm going to, to direct him on how to do these things. Now, after a man has that knowledge and he does these things, could he keep that knowledge and not have to have it be miraculous? See, I, I, I say he didn't have to be miraculous. He could still have that knowledge. I mean, if, you, if you're carving stones, you, you learn how to carve stones or learn how to work with brass or, or gold or silver that you previously didn't know. But once you've learned it, once you learned it, you don't have to keep having miraculous knowledge to do that. And so this is what we're talking about. Why would God keep giving them this wisdom after the work was done? Now let's apply that to the New Testament. You have, you have men like Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and the twelve apostles, and Paul, and so forth, and they are being guided into all truth by the Holy Spirit. They're being given all this information that they didn't know, previously didn't know, or had forgotten, brought all things to remembrance, and they're given all this information, and they're writing it down. Uh, I mean, Paul's writing letters, Peter's writing letters, James is writing letters, John's writing letters. And so they're writing this down. Now, once it has been written down, do I need to have a, a special gift of knowledge or wisdom in order to continue knowing that or can I just go back and read the book you, you think Paul after he wrote say first and second Corinthians or Galatians and Ephesians or whatever you think once he wrote those letters he said now now I still need this miraculous gift Lord because even though I have written inspired letters to these churches and people are going to be copying them and giving copies of these letters to different people I still need miraculous gifts so that I can say the same thing to the Ephesians later on. No, you don't need that. You've written it down. And so once the knowledge has been given and it has been written down and preserved and confirmed, there, there's no more need for, for the miraculous giving of that information because it's been given once and for all and finally. And that's, and that's what Jude says. In Jude, uh, verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write to you and exhort you, you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Well, it doesn't need to be given again. It's, it's been delivered once. So, this is why there's no, no more need for, for miracles. Because the word was used to confirm the messenger or the message, all right? It was either, the, the miracle was either the giving of the information or it was confirming the information that was given. And once that information had been given, there's no more need for miracles to keep confirming something that's already been confirmed, all right? You don't need to keep confirming that. And so that, that's why they've ceased. Now, when we read, when we get to the New Testament, we, we have clear understanding that when this information is completely given, when the information that God wants for men to know has been completely given, revealed, then the miraculous aspect of it is going to, be, is going to cease. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, they shall vanish away. Now we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now think about it, friends. When Paul said knowledge shall vanish away, he's not talking about all knowledge. He's talking about the miraculous giving of knowledge. Let's back up to chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and look at these gifts that, that, that are listed the gifts that God uh, gave to the early church. 
the, the gifts of the Spirit. Verse 8, 1 Corinthians 12, 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge. That was the miraculous giving of information that the previous didn't know or didn't remember. And so the, the, the Spirit is guiding them into all truth by having them remember this. But now, when the perfect is come, that is going to be done away with. That word of knowledge, that miraculous giving of the word of knowledge is going to be done away with. But it doesn't mean the word of knowledge that has already been written down and confirmed is going to be done away with. See that? Once, once, it's been, once it's been written down and preserved and confirmed, you don't need, it doesn't need to be confirmed again. All right? <clears throat> and so, that's why Paul said, whether it be prophecies, whether it be the knowledge, whether it be tongues, these are all things that are temporary. They were the temporary uh, uh, givings of this information. But once they had been written down, once, once it was finished, once the, the faith was finished, there's no more need for the miracles, for the miraculous giving of it. All right? So it was just like once, uh, uh, what, once, once Moses had the Ten Commandments and the law was given, and it was confirmed this was the law of God, this was the law of Moses, uh, it didn't need to be confirmed again and again. You think there need to be confirmation of the Ten Commandments every time the children of Israel heard the law being read? Do you think that, <clears throat> do you think that in uh, Nehemiah, let's just look at Nehemiah chapter 8, uh, Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 1 all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had commanded to Israel and Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation both of men and women and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month and he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning till midday before the men and the women and all those that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. Now, as they're reading this, the book of the law, this is, uh, I don't know how many years this is after this. this is, they've already gone through 70 years of captivity and they're coming back out. So, you know, we're, we're talking about hundreds of years after the law of Moses was given. Now, when they are listening to the word of the law of, of Moses read, do you think they need some miraculous confirmation? Do you think they need, well, no, wait a minute now. How do I know that's the law of Moses? We need, <clears throat> Ezra, we need your face to shine. No, they didn't need that. There was no doubt this was the law of Moses. It had already been confirmed. It had already been confirmed, and it was had already been given. So it was written down, it's confirmed, so we know this is the, the law of God. <clears throat> so we don't need a confirmation of it. Well, same thing with the New Testament. Friends, I have a Bible. I have a Bible that, that I believe is the Word of God, and I know that it can be confirmed as the Word of God. There's abundant evidence that this is the inspired Word of God. I don't need a miracle to confirm that. It has been once and for all delivered, once and once and uh, once delivered, there is a completeness to the faith. And that's what we're talking about in Galatians 1 and verse 23. Galatians 1 and verse 23, notice this. Paul said that the folks in Judea, they didn't know him by faith, but they'd only heard that he which not persecuteth us in time past, now preacheth the faith which he once destroyed. So, the faith was being completely revealed and confirmed by miracles and once it was being confirmed once it was being uh, <clears throat> once, it, once it had been confirmed it didn't need miracles to continue uh, proving that it was the word of God people knew Paul was, a, was an apostle they knew Peter was an apostle they knew these inspired men that were writing uh, they had been confirmed as inspired men proven and so once they have their credibility as men of God, there's no more need for miracles 
uh, and once all the information, the knowledge and wisdom and so forth has been written down, again, no more need to confirm it. But now, look at 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 13, and let's read this again. Paul says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Well, what is the what is the perfect? What is the perfect? Friends, there's a lot of people that probably have different ideas about what the perfect is, but remember, remember we've got to have the total of God's word on this. And one of the best ways, if not the best way, to find out what's being said in a particular verse is to stay in the context. Paul just said, we know in part, we prophesy in part. That is, the information that is being revealed is in part. All right, it's part in word of wisdom, part in the word of knowledge, partly through prophecy, partly through the gift of tongues, and so forth. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. There's the parts are going to look like the perfect. All right, the perfect is going to look like the part. Well, what do the parts look like? The parts look like little pieces of God's wisdom, God's revealed will, coming to man in different ways, whether it be the speaking in tongues, whether the gift of knowledge or the gift of, of wisdom or the gift of prophecy. Those are things that are done in part. So the perfect is going to look like those parts. It's sort of like this, friends. If you had, let's say there were 66 people, and we each had a book of the Bible. Somebody, you know, Bob's got Genesis, and Fred's got Leviticus, and Sally's got uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and so forth, all the way down to Revelation. Everybody's got one book of the Bible. Now, we could say, well, we all have the Bible. Well, we all have, we all have what belongs in the Bible, but we won't really have all of it in one place until it's all put together. So right now, the Bible, if everybody had one, one book of the Bible, would be in pieces. It'd be in parts. But when we put it all together, guess what? When we put it all together, now it's perfect. Now it's complete. And that's what that word complete, uh, perfect really means. Uh, perfect means complete or, or full grown. It's not, we're not talking about sinlessly uh, perfect. We're talking about something that's complete and full grown. And so if um, if a book is being written then it's just in part. But when it's completed now it's perfect. In other words, that it's, it's, uh, it's finally finished. And that's what Paul's saying. We're giving you little bits and pieces of, of what belongs in the Bible here and there and so forth. But when the perfect has come, when when all the pieces come together, then you don't need the parts anymore. You don't need the um, the giving of the information in bits and pieces because we have it all written down in one place. And that's what the perfect is. The perfect is the completed will of God. Now, somebody might say, well, it's Jesus. Well, Jesus is perfect. Well, I want you to notice Jesus is not perfect for a couple of reasons. Number one, number one, when the perfect would come, there would no longer be, uh, or the perfect would come when hope and faith are in existence. Because the very last verse of uh, chapter 13 says now about a faith, hope, and charity, or faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Well, when if Christ is the perfect, but well, when Christ comes, there's not going to be any more hope. Because hope is the substance of things hoped for, or excuse me, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And once Christ comes, you don't have to hope that Christ is going to come because he's there. Romans 8, 24, we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? 
So it's just like, you know, it's just like you're saying, well, boy, I hope, I hope that, uh, you know, we're going to have macaroni and cheese for supper tonight. You know, I, I hope we're going to have uh, biscuits and gravy. Boy, well, I, you can hope all you want to. But when biscuits and gravy are set on the table, and you're saying, boy, I hope, I hope we have biscuits and gravy for supper, well, when I sit down at the table and there's biscuits and gravy, guess what? I don't hope for it anymore. Because there it is. When it's on my plate, I don't hope for it. You know, and I may hope for I may hope for time to get finished, but I don't hope for biscuits and gravy because I've got it. See? You don't hope for things that you see. So if Christ is what's perfect, then how do you explain Paul saying now about these three? Faith, hope, and charity. And so the, uh, these were already in existence. So uh, when Christ comes, there's no more. There's going to be no more hope. There's not going to be no more faith. Faith's going to be lost inside. So uh, it, it can't be Christ. No, furthermore, perfect. The word perfect there in First Corinthians uh, chapter thirteen is it's it's a neuter word or it's, it's gender neutral. Now, I know we know what those are because, you know, we got all this transgender neutral garbage going on. That means it's not masculine or feminine. But Christ is masculine. But perfect in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 10 is neuter. It, it does, it's not male nor female. It's a, it's a, it doesn't have that connotation to it. So it's not Christ. It's not love. These are things that are uh, that don't fit the context. What Paul is talking about is the revealed will of God that is uh, going to come and be completely revealed, and then there's no need for miracles. All right. So when the perfect has come, then the parts are, are going to be done away with. So why do I not why do I not believe in miracles for today? Because the Bible says that there's no more need for them. Friends, if you believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. If you believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, why do you then turn around and say we need a miracle? Because when you say I need a miracle, then what you're saying is you don't really believe the Bible. If you really believe the Bible, you wouldn't go, but I need a miracle. Because miracles work to confirm the word. So you must not, either, either you don't believe the Bible or you don't know the purpose of miracles, one or the other. Maybe both. But, uh, if miracles were for for the purpose of confirming the word, if you say you believe the Bible, then you have to let go of the miracles, because that's what they were used for. Now, uh, so the purpose of miracles. Remember where we started. The purpose of miracles was to confirm, was to confirm the message or the messenger. Now, what does that say about these groups that? still believe in, in miracles. Uh, listen, you've got, uh, uh, for example, let's just think about this. You have um, folks like the Adventists. The Adventists believe in, in miracles. I mean, they believe Ellen G. White was, had to get the prophecy and, and so forth. And then you have, let's say, the, the United Pentecostals. You know, they believe in miracles, healing, and things like that. Um, what does that say about God? If miracles were for the purpose of confirming the message, and you've got these different, differing groups that have differing messages, but they're all claiming that their message is confirmed by miracles, or they're all claiming they, they do, can do miracles, then it must be they're claiming that God is confirming what they believe. That's the purpose of miracles, to confirm the message. So if they're all doing these different, uh, different, uh, following different doctrines, teaching different doctrines, then here's the problem. Either, either they're lying and not really doing miracles, or God is confirming differing doctrines and causing all the confusion that we have in the religious world. 
Now, which is it? Uh, well, since God is not the author of confusion, I'm going to say these folks that claim to do miracles are not really doing miracles, and therefore their message is not really being confirmed by miracles. Uh, because if they were all doing miracles, and everybody and, and miracles were to confirm messages, then you've got God confirming all kinds of different messages that I know, I know, you know, he's not doing. But, or again, if you don't remember that confirming uh, the message was the purpose of miracles, it, it, you won't think anything about everybody, you know, the, the Seventh-day Adventists and the United Pentecostals and the Catholics all believing in, in miracles, and yet they're teaching different doctrines. See how it all ties together? If you understand the purpose of miracles, all these people that believe in miracles cannot be from God because... God would not be confirming messages that conflict and are contrary to his will. Now, uh, in, in just a few minutes that I have left, and I, I haven't been getting the phone numbers out, I know that, I've just kept going. But if you want to call in, we do have time. Uh, there you go, 336, 427-9696, uh, 427-9696, or 627-9563, or 276-340-2653. We've got to take, take your call. Um... Uh, Here's something you need, you need to consider, friends. Bible miracles, miracles that you find in the Bible, are nothing like today's so-called miracles. And so when you're questioning someone about miracles or when you're questioning what you've been taught about miracles, when you're questioning what I'm saying about miracles, just ask this question. What is the difference between miracles in the Bible and miracles that are done, supposedly done today? Well, Bible miracles uh, were done openly. Everybody could see them. Everybody, everybody uh, knew that they were miracles. In Acts 2, verse 22, we just read this a little bit ago. Acts 2, in verse 22, uh, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you. Now, friends, I I haven't seen very many miracles done in the midst of people. And I've seen, you know, guys like Benny Hinn wave his hand and people fall down. That that's not a miracle. Uh, I don't know what that is, but that's that's not a miracle like you see in the Bible. But oftentimes, when you hear when you talk about miracles, you hear about miracles they're happening over in Africa. They're over in uh, some other continent, you know, they're in Australia or wherever. They're, you know, 10,000 miles away and they're not done right here in the midst of anybody. Uh, so that's one thing. Why is it that miracles aren't done openly? Why why, doesn't, why don't some of these miracle workers go down and just clear out the, the top floor of the hospital? You know, everybody's talking about health care costs going up. Why just, man, save us some money on insurance. Just go out and just heal all these people with these... Uh, you know, pre uh, what pre pre existing conditions. You know, can you imagine going and working for an interest company, Blue Cross Blue Shield? My rates going up. You know what, Blue Cross Blue Shield? I can tell you how to save a whole bunch of money. How's that? Well, I can cure all the people with pre existing conditions. All right, Bible miracles were instant. You don't see those today. Today they're not instant. They take time. That's a blind man one time. You know, why was, he, why was he still blind? Well, God works in his own time. No, friends, in the Bible, miracles were done instantaneously. These are some questions I hope you're asking yourself about miracles. I'm, I'm out of time. Friends, if you want to contact me, word from the Lord at gmail.com, word from the Lord at gmail.com, 276-340-2653, 276-340-2653. Thanks for listening. And as we close, we always want to remind you that if you're looking for the truth, always make sure that what you're getting, not what a man says, not what someone thinks or feels, but always getting a word from the Lord.